Welcome everybody, come on in, grab a seat, make yourself comfortable. We'll be starting in just a couple minutes. Maybe just a minute now. And unlike some of the sessions, I'll, I'll repeat this, but um, you're going to be encouraged to use the chat to share some thoughts and responses to questions that our speaker will present you. So feel free to use the chat in this session. Welcome everybody, I'm Brian Mallow and I'll be your host for this session, which is in the Responsible Technology Innovation Track. And we have a really interesting session. Our, our uh, speaker studies the social implications of technology. And uh, I, I believe this is the talk, the title of the talk deserves being said out loud at least once. So the topic, uh, the title of our talk today is Embedding Human Values in the Design of a Technotherapeutic Implantable System for U.S. Warfighters, a multi-layered socio-technical inquiry from proof of concept to prototype and testing. So before we get started, uh, I want to let you know to use the, you'll be able to, you'll be encouraged to use the chat function today but also use specifically the Q&A tab if you have questions for the speaker, and we hope you will. Send them in at any time through the session, and uh, we'll have a Q&A uh, in the last 15 minutes of this 45-minute slot. Um, I'll have some more notes for you at the end, but let's go ahead and get started. So thanks for tuning in, welcome. And our speaker today, is a public interest technology advocate who worked extensively in industry before moving into academia. She's widely recognized for her contributions to a better understanding of the impact of emerging technologies on society. She's a professor at Arizona State University in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence. Please welcome Katina Michael. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Brian, and what an honor to be with you today. And thank I should say you before, yes. I'm sorry, but thank you for joining us from Australia where it's very early there. It's later in the afternoon for a lot of us, but thank you for getting up just to participate in this session for us. Oh, thanks so much, Brian. I wouldn't have missed this for anything. Uh, it's not every day you get asked to talk uh, at this wonderful society with such a huge history. Um, credit to all of you for your participation and active uh, uh, membership, um, but I hope today's session uh, will spark some chat and interaction. Uh, I know with Zoom, we often have a, a one-way conversation, but please, uh, if I can entice you uh, to share your thoughts and uh, prompt me as we go through with questions. I won't repeat the actual title, just to say I've always been interested in implantable since my uh, research uh, uh, days uh, as a PhD student, but increasingly we're seeing the application of these implantable devices for various reasons, uh, whether they're security, uh, e-payments, uh, health and biotechnology, and now even the application in a technotherapeutic sense for US warfighters. At least that is a proof of concept on the table with DARPA. Before I begin, a uh, short disclaimer, I'm not an employee of the Department of Defense or the US government. The views presented are not the views of DARPA, the Department of Defense or the US government. Further, the activities are not endorsed, sponsored or promoted by DARPA, DOD or the US government. In fact, I'm an, a volunteer LC panelist uh, tapped on the shoulder uh, by DARPA to participate in what is a highly technical uh, area. 
My affiliation is just to put them on the table, as I mentioned, uh, I'm at ASU. I have a joint appointment also with the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence, and I'm the director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective. I'm also a senior member of the IEEE in the Society on the Societal Implications of Technology, a board member on the Council of RFID, also a member of the IEEE Standards Association, uh, also a board member of the Australian Privacy Foundation since 2008, uh, have acted on the Consumers Federation of Australia and have been funded both by the National Science Foundation and the Australian Research Council. The abstract of the presentation as we swiftly move uh, over the next 25 minutes or so and then open to questions is that I'll be talking about the DARPA project called Adapter, a travel adapter for the human body, an implantable and or ingestible uh, proposition. I'll be looking at the DARPA process from proof of concept to prototyping to pilot testing. All the information I'm providing you with today is publicly available, none of it behind closed doors as that remains uh, under NDA, non-disclosure agreement. The conceptual frameworks we'll touch on are the LC slash ELSA approach, the socio-technical systems theory and human values as understood by the work of Batya Friedman and many more dating back to the 40s and 50s. And then a discussion on viability. If I said to you today, there was a potential for US warfighters to be bearing an implantable device for technotherapeutic reasons, what would be your initial response? Have a go in the chat. I'd love to see what you're thinking. So adapter. Adapter stands for the Advanced Acclimation and Protection Tool for Environmental Readiness. It's a program and located in the DARPA Biological Technologies Office, BTO. Adapter aims to develop a travel adapter for the human body, an implantable or ingestible bioelectronic carrier that contains cellular factories and compounds, that's like therapies, to be released upon secure external activation. Imagine a soldier on deployment having the command and control to trigger a release of therapies to prevent particular conditions in their own body. The system is designed to either entrain the sleep cycle, halving the time to re-establish normal sleep after a disruption, for example, with shift lag or jet lag, or to eliminate the top five bacterial sources of traveler's diarrhea. Consider it a remote control capability to wellness and recovery. Adapter is a way to physically interface with the human body, a type of wireless living pharmacy, via an implantable device that attempts to control the body's circadian clock, aiding to regulate cycles by providing accurate diagnostics and response mechanisms. Let's see, has anyone actually written their thoughts in the chat? Right, so we have a, one uh, member of the audience who said maybe it may help with PTSD uh, and could prevent suffering afterwards uh, for the individual warfighter, their families, and broadly more society. Great comment. This is a highly interdisciplinary technical teams that are involved in about three to four significant technical projects under the umbrella of Adapter. And these are the universities together with BlackRock Microsystems that are engaging in this innovation process right at the beginning at the nascent stage of invention. DARPA has long uh, dabbled in implantable systems, as was noted uh, by the uh, participant in the chat. They're heavily considering what the future might hold and soliciting proposals from cross-disciplinary technical research teams to ponder on one possible socio-technical imaginary, a future where implants tethered to smartphones are commonplace and not the exception, but the norm. In many ways, this imaginary the feedback loops between humans and machines preoccupied the great Norbert Wiener in his work on control systems theory and information theory. And what we have now through this mindfulness or through his mindfulness is a manner to ponder on the possibilities. Wiener gave us the notion of responsible innovation that has now been developed widely by so many researchers. We can't rule out anything in the future, especially given the socio-technical imaginary, imaginaries uh, capability, but we have to be sober with our analysis of what might come 
or even what should be. And in this instance, we see operational scenarios for entraining the sleep pattern and also responding to traveler's diarrhea. So imagine I'm wearing a device on, my, on an armband and that armband has an implantable just below it. And I'm using a device like a smartphone to trigger that device to emit different types of therapies into the body to assist me. So the operational scenarios are quite widespread. They could be internal to the body, internal to body worn on the surface of the body, or internal from the implant to external like a lamppost. There may be a number of these operational scenarios that we might have to consider down the track. Here's a close-up of one of the devices that is uh, cited on Northwestern University's website. Now, according to DARPA, the adapter program will develop a travel adapter for the human body, as we said, an implantable or ingestible bioelectronic carrier. Adapter is multi-application and multifunctional. It uses an integrated system to house a variety of biosensors that will be diagnostic and interventionist, disrupting the typical medical supply chain that is lengthy in preparation and delivery. When we get sick, we have to go and see the doctor and we are not nipping the issue in the bud, as we say in colloquial terms, but we're allowing it to, to take root and then responding to it. Well, imagine being able to provide a just-in-time antibiotic production response mechanism that would be wholly embedded and performed in vivo. Adapter will allow for toxin removal from ingested resources and will provide the soldier on deployment with the ability to quickly acclimatize due to time zone differences the body is unmistakably exposed to after long haul travel. Uh, and that's, as, as we said, shift lag and jet lag. So it's all about just in time pharmacy delivery, if I can put it in those terms. Here's another depiction. Adapter is not about altering the genetics of the human body, but working with the body to provide transient enhancement, enhancement and extension of warfighter readiness. In this figure, we see how this will work in a proof of concept using an edge device, that is an external hub, interfacing with what's called the normalizing timing of rhythms across internal networks of circadian clocks, N-train implant. Each transponder implant has a unique ID that will come with enough storage capacity to contain an encryption key for secure data transfer. The last thing you want is someone tampering with the device externally. It is believed that the implant will be embedded during an outpatient procedure into the subdermal, subdermal layer and the insertion site will be in the triceps of the individual as depicted right here on the right forearm or arm, I should say, tricep. It is believed that the implant will be embedded, as we said, and the chip will be triggerable by the battery powered hub attached to an external form factor, like a wearable armband or even a luggable smartphone. The hub will receive and transmit signals while tethered into a smartphone using a dedicated app. This is just one of the several operational scenarios. In-body device communicates with the on-body hub that are plausible for the future uh, of this implant type. What I'd like to hear from you in the chat perhaps is how do you feel about potentially being implanted as a public, uh, as a member of society? Does that make you feel uh, energetic? positive, especially if it's in a techno-therapeutic capacity. We have one uh, member here, participant, who said, I'm worried about enhancement technologies more than therapeutic technologies. In fact, DARPA has been very clear in the communications that this is not an enhancement technology. They're purely viewing it as a therapeutic response. And I think increasingly, says the participant, Eric Berling, that it's a hard line to draw and a concern of sliding down a slippery slope with implantables. When is it, for example, uh, used for uh, enhancement and when might it be just used purely for biotechnology? But that is definitely a slippery slope. And if it's for my benefits as one participant, um, am I the only one able to control it? And perhaps are there other members who may be able to do so? So thank you for those responses as we continue. Uh, another person said, are there not already trackers installed in us well, they're probably things that we lug around. I'd love to hear more by uh, that individual. And it depends on what the implants are for and if there are privacy concerns. Now, 
That's exactly right. That is, the, the DARPA process actually is cognizant of all of the issues that we're talking about. And today, given what I know, but the technical teams and has been published um, publicly, we know that DARPA goes through a process of proof of concept, prototype, and then potentially pilot or testing. Let's inspect that a little bit further. This is what a typical design thinking five-stage process goes through. An empathize, a definition of the problem, a proof of concept where we ideate, a prototype, and then finally testing that prototype and seeing it work live and actively if we're fortunate and it, it is a pilot. In this instance, we would be using uh, the technical teams with these research universities uh, to create the proof of concept, develop the idea, prototype, get it to the stage where there is an form factor and then releasing it to the public or to more specifically, I would say, US warfighters. The question is when after this point uh, that we go through this end-to-end -end process, what might happen with a technology that's been prototyped in this capacity? Is it then ripe for public uh, engagement and public implementation in a variety of other contexts? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, ethicists ask the questions, what are these dilemmas that we're struggling with uh, and, and considering? So I'll just really quickly go through the proof of concept. It's about finding out the real world potential. It's a small exercise, we're ideating at this point. We're trying to see if we can come out with some kind of product or at least point to a product. Whereas the prototype is a different stage. It shows the product that will be developed. It actually takes on form. So in the proof of concept, we're drawing, we're creating diagrams, we're ideating, we're getting some kind of like understanding of what we might be creating. And in the prototype is when we start to consider a form factor. It's tangible, it's functional, there's a manifestation of the idea, there is a touch point, there's a mock-up perhaps, and then we are able to actually directly talk about um, a solution. There's still a lot of uncertainty about how that solution might look and feel and work, but we're getting to refine our ideas as we test them out with each other and with the stakeholders engaged. A question is, when do we start to incorporate US warfighters in this proof of concept to prototype, to pilot testing, um, to ensure that we're getting a shared vision of the solution. Does a warfighter have rights when they enter the defense forces? I'd love to hear what you have to say on that shared vision. Um, if you were a soldier, someone came to you and said, look, we're thinking about reducing traveler's diarrhea on deployment. And we're also thinking about um, helping you to sleep better because we know that sleep deprivation is increasingly a problem. What would you do? Would you accept to receive an injectable device or an implant as has been noted here by one of the participants, or would you say, I want my autonomy? And can we have autonomy, even if we have something embedded like a complex socio-technical autonomous or semi-autonomous system? We already have insulin pumps uh, that work in a semi-automated -autom to automated fashion. Is this just the evolution of where we're going into the future? And we're talking about here, a design-driven innovation. And in this context, it is by government, well, at least the government arm testing the idea uh, with its US warfighters. Finally, a pilot where we can iron out um, some of those uh, early uh, teething problems. Uh, we can go to uh, the, the, the pilot stage without adequate testing, but that's not something I advise. I advise testing prior to the active pilot because what you don't want in these complex technologies is are any unintended consequences on human beings if we are going straight to the human being as the test bed. A lot of these uh, design thinking exercises are constantly considering what is the minimum viable product. And as one of my design thinking friends says recently, what we should be considering is the, not the minimum viable product, but the maximum valuable product is still an MVP, but it's the opposite to the thinking we have. And we'll return to this in a, at, at the discussion of this presentation. So theories and frameworks. We look back at work by Bostrom and, and Heenan in 1977 that look at this notion of a socio-technical system within an organization. And if we look at the defense force, it is a kind of organization and it is, it has a number of socio-technical systems that receive bi-directional feedback flows. In this instance, we are talking about a highly complex information system that is embedded in people. 
but there is this technology task and structure response we should consider. People like uh, Enid Mumford have talked about socio-technical design and pointed to values here and the definitions and how we classify values and how we incorporate values into socio-technical design. But your Friedman continues this in your value-sensitive design processes of the 80s and 90s, inspired by some of the work of Albert, uh, Norbert Wiener from 1954. Um, but if we go back to some of those values, I wonder what you would consider as being the values we should embed into proposed implantable systems to begin with. Batya looks at human welfare, ownership and property, privacy, freedom from, from bias, universal usability, trust, identity, calmness, environmental sustainability. The question is, what is it in this kind of system that you would be putting forward, I wonder? Um, are there values that Batya hasn't here in this particular paper, and she looks at the antecedents of values in previous literature that you would say are not here but should be? Somebody mentioned privacy before. Um, human welfare was also alluded to indirectly, but nobody as yet mentioned trust, although security was identified as one of those values. So how do we navigate this space? Do we identify several values? Do we look at it as a privacy by design exercise or a privacy and security by design? Are we looking at socio-technical design to be more broad in our thinking? Whatever we do, there is a movement now towards uh, more uh, a value-based approach than value-sensitive, and more so even today with some of the IEEE standards coming out in the P7000, an ethically aligned standard by design, not just value-sensitive or values-based, but ethically aligned. But what is this ethics that we're talking about? And again, another paper here by Amy Van Winsberg, again, identifying values, looking at other uh, scholarly works and bodies in a particular robotics uh, project she was looking at, Robotics for Care, and identifying these by stakeholder types. Are you an academic? Are you an NGO? Are you a government body? Are you an industry for-profit entity? And what is valuable to you in terms of, in this case, Robots for Care? But let's jiggle this around. What if we said implantables for technotherapeutics? Could we do a similar exercise in identifying a set of values? Again, I'd love for you to type in those values in the chat. Mumford identifies what we all want in these socio-technical systems. And I allude to two of these things. She says, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. And when we do this as an exercise, we ask ourselves, does this type of implant promote the general welfare? Does it secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to posterity? And is this not what we are desperately seeking in terms of values and hopes in our socio-technical systems as we bring them into uh, our fruition? So which stakeholder type are you? This is the quintuple helix. And based on who you are, you will have a different set of values. That's just how it goes, everyone. It doesn't mean that different people in different stakeholder types don't share common values. In fact, that's what we're hoping with, with value-based design or ethically alignment by design. We're hoping for this shared value set, but what are they when we look at the defense forces? What could they be? And how will it be different for different stakeholder types as they ponder that question? Skipping ahead here, as I mentioned, I'm part of the ELSI panel, one of four professors on that panel. Uh, it was formed by DARPA after the fact. I wasn't there at the problem definition stage, and that's a question I want to come back to right at the end. Uh, and what does it mean? We used the LC framework. It was really developed by James Watson in 1988 as part of the Human Genome Project. But as we go on, uh, a lot of people are saying, well, are we using LC approaches or responsible research and innovation approach approaches to simply do ethics washing? in lieu of regulation, in lieu of changes to the law. And the question is, can we preempt? Can we prejudge what is going to be when we do see the proliferation of these biotechnology devices that may help us with just-in-time medicine and just-in-time pharmacy? How do we catch up with our innovations in terms of the law and its lagging behind? And if we just base it purely on ethics uh, and law and society uh, principles, how do we prove that we have operationalized these principles into uh, fruition as we develop devices? So currently what we're seeing is these uh, silo disciplines. Okay, you do the ethics in society, we'll do the engineering, but 
how do these come together in an interdisciplinary way, in a transdisciplinary way, so that we can embed values in these highly complex semi-autonomous socio-technical systems. Skipping ahead here, uh, this is like the broad umbrella of ELSI, the ethical, the legal, the social. And we can consider these implantables as types of black boxes in two ways. One, it's a black box that's embedded beneath the skin. And another, it's the algorithm that will emit those responses, uh, medical responses in the body uh, as required and help the circadian clock uh, to get back in uh, sort of some kind of rhythm. So we've long understood body area networks. We've long understood the implants, uh, the wearables, and now these gateways, these hubs. And really that's what we're seeing when we're looking at some of these technical uh, project proof of concepts. And this stage, I think we are at the point where people are prototyping in the universities and coming out with form factors. This is not one of them. This is a commercial offering by the company VivoKey and looking at how implantables can be used for security reasons tethered to a smartphone. But we can see that there is a culture of change, at least to these kinds of perhaps once thought science fiction and socio-technical imaginaries now taking root in very small scale pilots. Now, socio-technical theory once overlaid with the LC approach, we can see here adds in that technical dimension. So we've got the socio, the technical, the ethical, and the legal. This becomes important in our discussion as we frame who are the stakeholders that have this shared vision? Are we incorporating the voices of those people that are not just technologists, but also part of the interdisciplinary? And what is interdisciplinary? According to DARPA, these interdisciplinary technical teams are technical teams. And I, I ponder on why they're actually called interdisciplinary beyond the fact they're from different engineering and technology and informatics disciplines. What we should be perhaps thinking about is how we can incorporate the voices of not just panelists like myself in the ELSI area, but also science, technology, society, and environmental studies. What else? I'd say the users. I'd say the families of the users, such as the warfighters that adapter may be trialed on in the future, but also the public who want to know that potentially there is a warfighter that is carrying an implantable device. You can imagine people wearing these bands, perhaps under their clothing, but what if it was a hot day and they're wearing the bands outside their clothing or perhaps a sleeveless shirt? Then we start to look at, at reactions by the general public, which we need to take into consideration. And these are some of the ways you would model the socio-technical system. Um, is an adapter here in the middle? Does the warfighter have a choice? Is the system auditable? What kind of care will the soldier receive? Uh, and you've got here the personal versus military values, the soldier's rights and the citizen's rights. Uh, and then on the technology side, is there an ability to remotely access and kill uh, the device if it's malfunctioning? Uh, or it has been intercepted by enemy, uh, uh, you know, uh, persons. Uh, imagine uh, intervening here and uh, disrupting purposefully the sleep cycle of a warfighter by simply either jamming or spoofing or intercepting in some way. Um, and then standards and guidelines. Where can we place these devices? Uh, where are the patents? Uh, where are uh, the guidelines uh, and the laws that may be established around these kinds of devices? What can and can we not do with these uh, as time goes on? Now, there's a big question here on why did we even consider this future mode of operation? What about the natural system, the body, to respond to both uh, traveler's diarrhea and jet lag? Is this something we can speed up uh, in terms of our response? And if we want to play the Desbos advocate for a moment, is this a form of technophilia, more about better technology, uh, uh, sorry, more and better technology preventing or fixing problems? You know, can we fix everything through technology? Is this a, a concept of techno solutionism? Uh, has there been adequate consultation with warfighters and uh, so many other things to ponder? Uh, you know, what is the role of the public in this debate? Uh, how do we? Uh, raise public awareness that this is actually being considered and how can we raise transparency uh, in order to garner public consultation processes. Um, 
And we have a great question here from a, a dear friend. Uh, have combat soldiers been asked about this technology? Good question. Uh, special forces definitely have uh, a small number of them, but who knows beyond that? But shouldn't we really be starting with that question? Um, that's a wonderful contribution there by the audience. So in conclusion, you know, design thinking organizations that work with the National Science Foundation purely in the past have considered feasibility, viability, and desirability. In terms of feasibility, that's exactly what DARPA is doing, purely looking at its technical feasibility. Can we do this? Is it possible to have techno-therapeutic devices uh, that do these things to assist soldiers? So they're purely investigating the technical aspects, although uh, from a government model or a defense model, there is no real business behind this. But as we see, a lot of the DARPA projects do spin off to be commercialized into the future. So the question is, what kind of business model or model within the defense forces might there be to see this proliferate among a huge number of people if we look at the defense forces in the US, for example? And on the desirability phase or stage, uh, have we asked those human questions? Do we want this? Uh, can't the body do it on its own? Is it desirable? What can go wrong? What are the unintended consequences? And what are the potential benefits? You know, folks, we receive uh, penicillin through tablet taking. Uh, others who have preconditions uh, are encouraged to be better at their behavior of taking drugs on time because that could help their condition and monitor it better remotely. We have seen RFID transmitters placed on some pills as test beds, even from Stanford University projects uh, from a few years back. So it's not like this is not being trialed in research universities or in the commercial sector or in the pharmaceutical sector for that matter. But when we look at this, there is from the idea kind of model, something is shifting. We now have in other models like Meld Studios, the addition of the ethical component. And if you took this another way, this is really the melding of the socio-technical design framework with the ELSI approach, the ethical, social, uh, legal implications. And we've put that here now as a fourth blob. So not is it only does it have to be feasible, desirable, and viable, but it also has to be ethical. And this is a great question. We're at that precipice now where we're starting to think about ethics in these potential devices. You know, down the track, will we have implantable devices that are acting as smartphones and doing things like brain-to-brain -brain computer interfacing? Who knows? Or brain-to-brain -brain communications. So the ethical dilemma to wrap up, does ethics come first? or does ethics come last, as the great Herman Tavani postulates? Which phase? Were the LC crew, the four members, the four professors brought in too late into the project? And others might say, well, at least they brought them in to begin with. That's an add-on, that's a success in itself when we're looking at uh, projects like this. How do we embed the human values in complex systems? How do we audit this from the first level of identification right through to the implementation? Can we do that? with this kind of system? And what about stakeholder engagement? As someone said in the audience so well, um, what happens? Uh, and finally, moving towards this macro, meso, micro, socio-technical inquiry mo model, which says, right, the defense forces may be oriented towards supporting the government drivers to this kind of implementation. At the meso stage, we have technical oriented feasibility articulated through systems of innovation, stakeholders on the technology production side coming together to offer a solution, not just the hub, not just the implant, not just the tethering with devices, not just the protocols and the communications and the storage and the security features, but that's the meso phase. And folks, I've lost my screen, so I'll go on the uh, last point, uh, if you can still hear me, uh, and the micro stage, which is the individual stage. Um, very important for a US warfighter to be included in that. And with that, uh, I'll wrap up and just try and get my screen back. So if you lose me for about one minute, please put your thoughts in chat, but I need to uh, just reboot. It will only take me about 30 to 60 seconds. So one moment, I'll be back. Thank you, Katina. You'll be back. Thank you for a thoughtful presentation. And
And if anybody has any questions, we still have time for some Q&A with Katina. Oops. Um, <laughs> sorry. Now I'm off for a second. Okay. I'm uh, sorry about that, folks. My audio. There. Um, so please send in any questions into the Q&A tab. And Katina, thank you very much. That was, you raised a lot of questions and some like, did we really, like we had one question in the chat that asked if combat soldiers had been asked about the idea since they're most familiar with possible risks. Um, you referenced it, but uh, did we do it? Are we at a stage where that's happened, where feedback from soldiers has been solicited already? Uh, to my awareness, uh, a small group of people have been uh, uh, engaged, uh, particularly those uh, with high risk defense portfolios, uh, where they are special forces, for example, and uh, they have spoken, uh, generally speaking, at events uh, and seem to be positive in their orientation. Um, I think increasingly we can see uh, both positives and negatives. I think the role of the LC panelists could be to uh, encourage more consultation as this process goes on. So still in the sort of first nine months of the, the, the project, but as we go and we move from proof of concept to prototype, you really should be engaging those stakeholders early on. So that's a great question, um, Brian. Uh, and I would like to see more uh, surveys conducted, for example, uh, with uh, US warfighters, uh, at least, you know, a thousand responses, a representative sample that could count towards some regression analysis and looking at those different kinds of values that people are concerned about and also qualitative research I don't just want like at scale kind of quantitative research. I want some open memo section, qualitative responses, and even select in-depth interviews just to get a good grasp. But that you're looking at a 12-month project for that. And you know, these innovation cycles don't wait 12 months. Um, you want to deploy, you want to test, you want to be agile, you want to be experimental, practical. And so there is this fine line between what we call praxistemology um, and theory and then coming back reflecting through that process and then looking at whether technology is deterministic, e.g. the implantable device, the, you know, supporting the, 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 the sleep and train and, and the traveler's diarrhea um, uh, will have inherent values that is po so positive that it'll just have its own life uh, and trajectory. Or it's the social shaping of technology where the US warfighters start to have dialogue and say, or stakeholders that is more broadly and say, no, we should be thinking about this. And if we wanna really do this, we need this in place. And let's start being anticipatory to govern such a, devi a device, not just reflexive and uh, put it out there and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It falls in the valley of death as an innovation and then we keep going. So top question, but all of these things to think about. Yeah, can I ask you, so is your background in, in engineering, like, do you have, did you come through the tech, before you moved into more social implications of, um, was, was, do you have training in the sort of technology or, and I, I, I guess, you know, and related yeah. to that, I guess, is that, are you involved in this, are you coming to this as now you're assessing these questions about this project, or are you involved in it in any way? It's a great question. The, yeah. Great question. So no, I'm not involved in it uh, directly. I'm not part of the teams. Uh, those interdisciplinary teams are, are separate. And that's a great question. Am I, I don't know, good question. Am I si simply an observer to what's going on and poking, you know, and asking those pertinent questions to the director of this group, uh, the BTO group. And I, I must say they've been very open uh, being poked by me and the other three panelists, uh, of which I think I do more poking on the potential unintended consequences, but ask those tough questions. Like, has anyone thought about deploying soldiers earlier and not having, you know, just going through the jet lag and, you know. Right, right, if we already know <laughs> that there's gonna be fighting in a certain part, of, that's what I was thinking while you were talking, that either, I thought of two things. One is, well, couldn't we artificially change their, while they're here, change their, their schedule or they get their, a couple of days before they're deployed. So the other question, my other big question was, are these overly technophilia sort of solutions, as you mentioned, to something that, uh, oh, diarrhea, haven't, don't they just take a pill for that? Why do I need an implanted device uh, to just take a pill? 
I was gutsy, Brian, and I did ask that question in the first full day meeting. Um, I, the, the room went quiet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah, we should have thought of that. No, no, only joking. Um, but, yeah, sometimes these ethics questions, you know, when we're talking about such highly complex semi-autonomous systems, we're talking about hugely sophisticated advanced technologies. So let me backtrack a bit, Brian. Uh, my uh, undergraduate studies were in computer science. Uh, my work life uh, was in consulting. So I worked for Anderson Consulting and also Otis Elevator Company in manufacturing, but also spent six years at Nortel Networks as a telecommunications engineer on the ground doing real work, implementing solutions, uh, was there when the 3G you know, wave hit and spectrum auctions were being done, uh, was there when we had you know, huge submarine cables and we were predicting on you know, potential upload and download demands and dimensioning to these incredible voice over IP potentials, which we're now seeing in, you know, everywhere. Everyone wants things on their device. My thesis was about automatic identification and I was studying implantables and brain, to brain communications. It wasn't simply looking at implantables from the perspective of uh, you know, what could you do to open doors or, you know, use it as your front key lock or something, or your car door, whatever. I was looking at where we were going with this and the trajectory. Uh, and that has, you know, led me to the area of emerging technologies. So I, I think your question, um, Brian, is, is 100% uh, important. Um, we have to ask those difficult questions that ethics sometimes wipes out with a single question you know, here you are looking at the micro detail of the micro technology of the, mi we got to step back. We need that macro view. We need that cross stakeholder view. We need that view which says to the everyday person that has no technical expertise uh, or limited by the lived experience because the lived experience and the professional expertise need to merge just like transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary studies. So you just can't have engineers. And I'm in those gifted positions where I have a background in engineering and computer science but I also do social sciences and ethics and have been looking at responsible innovation for years. So bridging this gap and the other panelists, are either medical or legal specialists, as in that LC framework, plus have some technology exposure. But I would say that's a great question. We need more people on board earlier in the process. And somebody said, what is ethics washing? It's yeah. saying that I'm doing ethics, but not living by ethics. It's mm. saying that I'm pointing to moral values, but not implementing the moral values. It's saying, look, I have an ethics team within organization X and Y, but it's just all talk, it's lip service. It's, I can't see in an auditable process where ethics has been embedded right from the get-go. Did this problem, this dilemma that we're trying to resolve, did we have any early stakeholder engagement? And if not, why are we proceeding to technophilia or techno-solutionism as a response to a human problem. But it's so, I'm not being negative about it. I'm just saying, let's look at this as a design. Right. But I think this answer you just gave was got me closer to understanding what your motive is. So you are the one raising these questions about this. This isn't something you're involved in. And, and these are questions that you're raising. And so two different people asked about the ethics first or after. Um, one is, would it make sense to put ethics first if there's a breakthrough? Uh, does it yeah. matter if it can't be used responsibly or are there any stakeholders in organizations like DARPA that earnestly argue for ethics after, and it's kind of a Pandora's box thing. It's like, how can you, it's pretty hard to, isn't it kind of who, who argues for ethics after, isn't that too late? Fantastic questions from the audience. I mean, you should, uh, you know, we should be giving joint talks here. I think uh, <laughs> th these are all great questions. So, when do you embed ethics? Well, in the traditional design process of any organization, security, privacy, all of those important functional values, they're always left out. They're add-ons, they're bolt-ons, if we have enough money, if we have enough time. We're seeing the deployment of IoT cameras that have no password protection. Hmm. I could go and not, not, not by any reason, just find the device on the web. I've talked about this in the past and view what other people are viewing remotely. It's like they don't know there's no password protection. So we forego those fundamental functional requirements and we think those values aren't important, but increasingly trust will be important and we can formalize trust in proofs. Uh, security and privacy by design will be increasingly important. It's already in the GDPR. So where do we put ethics? 
you know, I asked that question to Professor Kevin Warwick, who was the first implantee. Uh, he rigged up his uh, cybernetics lab at the University of Reading in um, 1998. And he was one of my first interviewees in my thesis. It was like, Professor Warwick, you know, what about ethics? Ah, you can't prejudge ethics. You've got to put it out there and then they'll, you'll figure it out and then you'll know what the people will do. You know, really? Okay, that's one mm. approach. And then um, you've got all these other people saying, no, you know, um, it's never after the fact. It's yes. always at the beginning. Katina, I hate to cut you off. We have some other great yeah. questions. I want to, I want to, maybe I can say something about them, but thank you for a very yes. thoughtful presentation. Yes. I want to let people know that uh, coming up at four is the John P. McGovern Award presentation. Check that out for Eastern and the evening's award ceremony at five Eastern. And that'll wrap up the conference, except tomorrow the STEM art and film festival kicks off at 10 a.m. And wow. just to mention uh, someone made up a good point. It's like, especially remember after Vietnam, how stigmatized soldiers were knowing that a soldier has some kind of implant. Will that, if the public knows that, will that lead to more stigmatization? Interesting point. Interesting. Um, yeah. People say that implantables actually reduce stigmatization if you can't see it, especially with people who are trying to reform, for example, pedophiles or others. Uh, and the jury's out on that, of course, but they talk about yeah. the reduction of stigmatization if you can't see the implantable. If there's no hub or end train and it's just an implant, what does that do? Well, thank you very much. I think there are a lot of other questions uh, to raise here and it, it's already 345 and people can go to their next sessions. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for very thoughtful. Uh, maybe we can talk again um, and, and, and ask, get to more of these. Uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, thank Brian, you so much. Thank you. Thank you.